Well, in 1992, Gary Chapman released his book, The Five Languages, excuse me, The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts. I'm positive a majority of you have heard of it, even if you have not read it. It quickly became a huge hit in both Christian and non-Christian circles. And since its initial publication, it has sold over 20 million copies. From the title, you can tell there are five major ways of communicating love according to Dr. Chapman. You can name them with me if, if you know them. Number one, words of affirmation. That's verbal compliments or words spoken. Number two, quality time, doing something together and being focused in that moment together. Number three, receiving gifts, anything from spontaneous bouquet of flowers to more significant presents to a loved one. Number four, acts of service, acts of service, helping another person with chores or cooking a meal or in some sort of actionary way, loving on them. And then number five, physical touch, holding hands or physical intimacy in a, in a marital context. And the idea is that all of us have different ways of feeling love and all of us have different ways of communicating love. The way that comes most naturally for you to communicate your love may not be the way that your child or your parent or your friend or your spouse or your relative interprets love. I think there's a lot of wisdom in having this framework when relating to others because as you know, we Christians are called to love others. Love is a distinguishing attribute of God that we are called to imitate as his image bearers and more specifically as his children. But like any resource, there is a danger of misapplying the ideas in this book. If we're not careful, we can begin to adopt a mentality of love languages that is, I scratch your back in the way that you like and then you scratch my back in the way that I like. And on the receiving end, there's actually the danger of becoming self-centered in how you understand others to be loving you or failing to love you. If you don't get what you want in the way that you want, it's a temptation for us to become dissatisfied. Of course, that's not a, a, a loving interaction at all, is it? That is to say, Yes, you can and you should aim to love others in the way that you know the other person will feel loved. On the contrary, when you're on the receiving end, if someone goes out of their way to give you a gift, but you prefer words of affirmation, you mustn't automatically question their love for you or become frustrated with them. The temptation is to think the other person is not loving at all when it's not on your specific terms. Love can be so simple, yet it is also very complex. It's simple in, in concept. Someone does something for another at the expense of self. Yet it is also complex because people can love you in a way that you don't receive as love, but it is still love. Take the parent-child dynamic, for instance. Children feel loved in very specific ways. At young ages, they may not be able to clearly articulate how and when they feel loved, but they feel it. Yet parents will do things to and for their children that the children don't fully understand and don't receive it as lo the loving thing to do, even when it is indeed done out of a loving heart from the parent. Just because children don't have the lens to understand their parents' actions as love does not mean it's not actually love. The same goes with our relationship to God the Father. As a good father, God never acts without love towards his own. 
a biblical understanding of God's love shows us that God cannot act without love towards those who belong to him. For those whom he has a covenant relationship with, for those who've placed their personal trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, God is so committed to them with a loyal love. The challenge for us is we don't always interpret our Heavenly Father's actions as loving. We're like the person who understands love to be words of affirmation, but when we receive a gift, we wonder if the other person really loves us. When God leads us through circumstances we'd rather not go through, circumstances filled with pain, circumstances filled with hardship, circumstances filled with correction, We wonder, does God really love me? What we need is a reorientation, a rewiring, perhaps even a redefining of how God lays his loving hand upon us. We need a loving reminder that God dishes out, quote unquote, tough love. I hesitate to use this language because I think it's more likely to stick, but because I think it's more likely to stick, I'll say it anyway, we need to be reminded of God's love languages. He doesn't just love by way of blessing or by way of sacrifice or by way of provision. He loves by way of discipline. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4. The original audience of Hebrews was languishing in their faith. A major aspect of the languishing was because of the opposition they faced for their personal commitment to Christ. And last week, we heard the author's exhortation to continue running the race with endurance. The sermon letter of Hebrews is the author's pleading with these fellow Jewish counterparts not to abandon Christ. And part of the reason we can presume they were tempted to abandon Christ is because of the difficult circumstances and the persecution they faced prompting them to think that God did not love them. Isn't that a universal question God's people ask when they face hardship? Does God really love me? If he does, why is my life so hard? Well, the answer is discipline. God shapes and fashions his people through discipline. God helps his people get across the finish line by steering them in the right direction when they start to veer off course. One of his quote-unquote love languages to them, God's love language to them, is discipline and chastisement. The question for us is, will we have ears to hear his voice? Will we have ears to hear his voice? With that said, here's the main idea of today's sermon. God speaks to his people by way of tough love. That is discipline. God speaks to his people by way of tough love. That is discipline. So in order for us to kind of examine this point, we have three headers for the sermon this morning. You can see those headers on the back uh, page of the bulletin. We're going to look at this passage through three kind of categories or headers, discipline and love, number one, number two, discipline and belonging, and number three, discipline and holiness. Number one, discipline and love, number two, discipline and belonging, number three, discipline and holiness. Now, at this point, I have yet to even define what discipline is. The truth is, discipline is not just corrective. It's not just the, you're going in the wrong direction, let me place you back on the right path. Discipline is also formative. And from a broad perspective, discipline is the process by which God shapes, 
forms and directs his people into becoming more Christ-like. Thus, we have spiritual disciplines. It's a good name for them. Things like Bible intake, personal and corporate prayer, Lord's Day corporate worship, fasting, accountability relationships, and the like. God utilizes all these means to fashion us and and make us look more like his son. And for our purposes today, we will focus more on the corrective aspect of discipline. But in the back of our minds, we can remember the purpose of discipline on the broad level is to conform us to the image of Christ. And as it relates to corrective discipline, Our culture doesn't typically associate it with love. You won't find it in Gary Chapman's book, even in revised editions. But it is in the Bible. It is in the scriptures. It is actually one of the main ways the Lord speaks to his people. My hope is that you would observe his corrective and formative discipline and embrace it even when it's hard. So number one, let us consider discipline and love. Look with me starting in verse five and following. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The author quotes what would have been a familiar passage to his audience, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 to be specific, the same text that made this morning's call to worship to open up the service. And our tendency as sinners living in a fallen world is to recoil when we receive correction. Often what happens is we receive correction from an external source and we have one of two choices. We can receive the correction or we can reject it. We reject it because something is happening within us in our hearts, that we can't see on the outside. Sometimes it's that we don't agree with or believe the content of the correction. Sally rebukes Susan for speaking to her children harshly, but Susan honestly doesn't agree that she was actually speaking with harsh words. Sometimes it's an issue of hard-heartedness where the person receiving correction loves the sin that he or she is in, Jim can reprove Jack, warning that the adulterous relationship he's involved with will lead him straight towards hell, but Jack has no no ear for the correction because he loves his sin. However, the most common reason for rejecting correction is usually because of our pride. Who enjoys being told, you're wrong? What you did was sinful. You need to turn around in the opposite direction. We all know the primary function of corrective discipline is showing another where they have erred and to try to get them back on the right path. Pride, the very sinful pride we've all inherited from our father Adam, refuses to listen because we've made ourselves bigger than we really are. And we recoil to admit that we are wrong because of an inflated view of self and a minimized view of God and others. Not only are we full of pride, pride adversely affects our ability to interpret truth from falsehood. You see, correction stings, doesn't it? When someone tells us we're wrong, we're quick to defend ourselves and and put up a wall because we feel like we're being attacked. We don't like it. So regardless of the credibility or accuracy of the correction, we often receive it as an assault on who we are and our fundamental identity. So even if the rebuke is true, often our initial reaction is usually doubt or questioning. 
And because of this, our judgment and thinking is all clouded. Therefore, we're easily tempted to attribute harmful motives to the rebuker. How often is our initial reaction to rebuke the questioning of the character of the one admonishing us? That person is saying I'm materialistic because she's jealous of all the things that I have. She wants and does not have, therefore she's accusing me. Johnny, you're critical of me, calling me harsh because you are yourself so insecure. You can't handle a straight shooting kind of guy like me because you are so sensitive. Don't be so soft, bruh. All this to say, we reject corrective discipline because we fail to see it as an act of love. We're easily blinded by what we perceive as an attack on us, and it hardly crosses our mind that the correction could be offered from a pure heart. From the standpoint of Hebrews, it's the author's purpose to remind his audience that discipline and hardship come from a heart of love. They have a better chance of finishing their race if they consciously know that the persecution and difficulties resulting from their association with Christ come from the sovereign hand of God who loves them infinitely so. Now, it's not altogether clear whether or not the author views their persecution as a form of formative or corrective discipline. Again, it's probably both, but that's beyond the point. The author wants them, and the author wants us to remember God's love language of discipline. He loves his people by ushering difficult situations into their lives. Not just bringing tough situations into their lives, but also bringing them through it. Divine love from the heavenly realm often comes through a divine rod. The question is, do we have a category for it? Our heavenly father never interacts with us absent a heart of love, never. Every relational interchange from God to those who are in Christ will always Always be infused with divine love, even the hard interactions. Again, the the best illustration we can go to here is that of the parent-child relationship. Imagine a family playing in their front yard where the sloped driveway leads into the street. Kids are riding their bikes into the street running after a kicked soccer ball, and doing what normal kids do. One of the children in the family loves to run into the street for no reason, even when the, parent, the parental figure is, is, is given, the warning is given, car coming, stay out of the street. All the kids listen, except for that one. This one just has to jet onto the asphalt. And it's not just one time, it's a, it's a pattern What's the loving thing to do for that parent, from that parent? Now, if you're thinking, bribe the kid with a piece of candy to positively give him something better than going onto the street. If you're thinking that, you're wrong. That's not love. The right thing to do is to discipline the child. The book of Proverbs wisely says, with a rod. Proverbs 13, 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. No, controlled, level-headed, calm spanking is not child abuse. It's love. It's love, actually. To discipline the child who refuses to heed the warning of car is the most loving thing the parent can do. And when our Heavenly Father disciplines us, whether formative or corrective, we must see his love behind it. When the Christian life gets hard, when difficulty after difficulty mounts right before us, 
We should actually be encouraged because it is a sign of God's love for us. Yes, it is painful and difficult to endure. Verse 11 tells us as much. But we mustn't be so narrow-minded and defensive to think his love must come to us in every way that we expect it to. Now, we could draw a myriad of applications from this principle of discipline and love. Let me just highlight a couple. The first, from the receiving end. That is when we are the recipients of God's discipline and love. Most of the time, pretty much every time, it's hard, again, to receive correction. Nevertheless, we must learn to patiently examine the correction on the merit of the content In a fallen world, rebuke will be delivered both kindly and severely. All of us are less likely to receive it as if when it comes to us in the latter, when it comes to us severely. That's that's understandable. Yet delivery cannot be the final determinant of whether we listen to it or not. Train yourself to ask, is the rebuke itself legitimate? Is the content of what the person's saying correct? Because it is not outside of God's ability to write straight lines with crooked sticks. What I mean by that is, despite the tone, despite the delivery of imperfect messengers, God loves us enough to tell us what we need to hear. And in a fallen world, even with people who we know love us, they will dish it out and they will correct us in a flaw-filled manner. In David Mathis's words, you must learn to hear God's voice in your brothers, irrespective of his ability to speak it in a gracious way. Humble yourself to examine the hard words themselves. God may have a lot to say through them, Again, God writes straight lines with crooked sticks. That's on the receiving end. What about how you deliver a word of discipline? Culturally speaking, I think it's hard for us to speak words of rebuke. Asian cultures don't tend to speak difficult words to one another. Generally speaking, we're more of the beat around the bush, sweep it under the rug type of bunch. We struggle to speak hard words. And for this church, 2022 was indicative of that. Have you ever thought of yourself as a channel of God's love when you admonish your brother or sister in Christ? God uses his word as we speak it to one another to express his love. A silent people is not a loving people. Church discipline is not just at the final stage when a church votes to remove a professing believer from church membership. Church discipline is actively happening, should be actively happening, when you, a professing believer, show another professing believer within the same church his or her fault with the aim of reconciliation. The heart of church discipline at the first step or the final step is the same. It's love. How many problems, how many issues would be nipped in the bud if God's people were more willing to be vessels of God's love via discipline, starting at the first step? Asking it positively, wouldn't local churches, including this one, abound in spiritual health if we practiced church discipline on a one-to-one level? Yes, they would, those churches, be more healthy. Yes, we would be more healthy. Are you convinced that speaking hard words to one another is the loving thing to do? Discipline and love. Well, number two, discipline and belonging. What are the factors that communicate to any given person a sense of belonging to a particular group? The answers could range. 
Sharing inside jokes helps an individual feel like he or she belongs to a group of friends. Donning the same uniform or jersey, practicing the same plays, and winning and losing together on a sports team contributes to individuals feeling like a sense of belonging to that team. Having your work positively acknowledged in a company or in a team within that company forms a sense of belonging. In a family, having parents who take care of their children and explicitly tell them, I love you, generates a notion of attachment and belonging for the child. And at CBCOC specifically, a common thread of belonging shows up in shared service. That's the, the, the most prominent theme I've noticed for eight years here. Actively serving in a particular ministry for a particular cause. We could all probably share various ways we've felt connected and experienced belonging in any given social context, whether it's family, school, work, or the church. I wonder if we ever associate discipline as a sense of belonging. Again, both formative and corrective. Discipline is God's way of saying, you belong to me. Look at the text. See with me in verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. First of all, the, the son language here does not exclude sisters in the faith. The ancient Near Eastern context identified sons as the ones receiving the inheritance from the next generation. But the truth, the theological truth, is that all Christians, men and women who believe in Christ, are sons of God, including sisters. All of us are sons of God in that we have a relationship with the Father and we have an inheritance promised to us and that we will receive in the life to come. The point the author makes here is God affirms his children belong to him through his discipline over them. God is treating his people as sons, as his children, when he disciplines them. For the Hebrew Christians... The hardships, the trials, the persecutions they experienced, whether it was formative or corrective, was ultimately from the hand of God. And the tough love he shared with them was to convey a message of, you are mine, you are my son. I think for the average Christian, we're not prone to, to regularly or consciously think of discipline, especially corrective discipline, as God's love language, so to speak, to tell us that we belong to him. And why is that? Because it's painful. It hurts. Look at verse 11 again. He says, for, all, for, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. And the human tendency is to fixate on the moment. It's to zoom in on the pain and the hardship of enduring. What I think the author is trying to get Christ followers to do is zoom out, to, to back up for the bigger picture. And it helps us very little to focus on the disciplinary action itself. Instead, it benefits us to see God's true intent behind it. Do you associate his discipline with belonging. There's this kind of unspoken rule from families to families and parents to parents. The rule is this. You are responsible to discipline your own kids. Saying it negatively, do not discipline my kids if you're not their parents. This rule extends even to grandparents. I do not want my kids receiving corporal punishment, corporal discipline from their grannies. If you're a grandparent, your role is not to discipline your grandkids. 
Yes, I know there's situations where grandparents are the parents because the parents have abdicated their role. I am not speaking to that situation. Earlier, I mentioned the rod of discipline in Proverbs, showing my cards to you. I do not believe the rod is metaphorical. It's a physical rod. The Proverbs instruct parents to discipline physically. As a general rule, parents should be disciplining their children by way of spanking. Now, we don't have time to get into all the details of how and when, at what age, and in what state of mind parents need to be in when they administer the rod. Assuming the rod is a grace for children, could you imagine if one of our elders observed one of my children disobeying God's commands and as a result took out a wooden spoon to spank them on the behind? All of us know instinctively that is a bad picture. Why? Because those children don't belong to any one of those elders. You'd get the same vibes if I took a child not having Chung in their family name and gave them a smack on the behind. That's wrong. And you know exactly why. Because those children do not belong to me as their father. Discipline properly administered is a sign of belonging. Now, children, if I can get your attention for a moment, if you're living under the household and the authority of a parent in our society, under the age of 18, you are a child. Now, children, your parents discipline you because you belong to them. Not only do they love you, but they want you to know that you are a part of their family. Of course, parents are sinful and and flawed. As a parent, I speak saying we need grace too. We need a lot of it. However, when you endure through discipline, remember this truth. Your parents are doing it because you are their son. You are their daughter. And if they do not discipline you, they're treating you just like they would some other kid. By failing to discipline you, they'd be saying, you do not belong to me. That is to say, consider discipline through the lens of Scripture. Now, for all of us who name God as our Father through Christ, when the Lord brings you through difficult seasons of your Christian walk, You appreciate it? Sometimes it takes a while, doesn't it, to recognize it? It was only when I was older where I was able to tell my parents, Mom, Dad, I think you you should have disciplined me more when I was younger. I was a rascal. It's not that they didn't discipline me at all, but I did get away with stuff. And in the moment, discipline makes us weary. It's painful. We try to avoid it. Usually in hindsight, we are able to remember our belonging. And if your life is absent of discipline, formative or corrective, you have reason to question whether you belong to God. If you're not being shaped by his word, you should wonder, am I really his child? If your life is absent the hardship that comes from having your idols and sins addressed, you should be questioning your belonging. Wherever we face trials or whenever we face trials, we must adopt a self-examining posture. Is there a, a sin that I need to repent of or turn away from? Is God graciously exposing something I'm finding meaning in besides him? There may be or there may not be, but either way, it is God's intent for us to reflect on it and indeed give it over to him if there is an idol there. The biblical text helps us to reflect on the why behind the discipline in our lives. If you've trusted in Jesus, do you believe God loves you and do you believe that you belong to him? Well, the truthfulness of your answer will be determined by how you respond to his discipline. 
We must aim to grow in accepting God's discipline joyfully on the one hand, but on the other, not getting totally crushed by it with discouragement. And the way we do that is by remembering God's fatherliness towards us. He is your father. Now, before we move on to the third and final header, let me briefly address those who have not have who have not had good experiences with their parents and specifically their fathers. These verses, to to a degree you could argue, imply that we get a picture of our Heavenly Father through how we perceive our earthly fathers. Some of us have had bad or just straight absent fathers. They were not and have not been the men you needed in your life. If your father over-disciplined you or exercised no discipline on you, that is on him. Sometimes I wonder that the view I'm giving my children of a heavenly father in the midst of my sins, in the midst of my failures, I will be called one day to give an account, and, and boy, is that sobering. Nevertheless, if you've experienced an upbringing filled with shortcoming from your father, you need to know. If you've trusted in Christ, you have a good heavenly father. You have a good heavenly father. Despite the sins of your earthly father, as one who has trusted in Christ and as one who has been adopted into his family, you are a child of God. Resist the temptation to view God, your father, as one who is like your earthly father. No one can take that away that your heavenly father is truly a good father for you. And the relationship God the father has with Jesus the son in a spiritual sense is the relationship that you've been invited into. All the benefits Jesus receives as son from his good father, you also receive by nature of your union with him by faith. Indeed, it was the tough love, so to speak, the father laid on his son at the cross, which enables you and I to identify as sons. All that to say, our earthly fathers are imperfect and sometimes downright failures. But God, God does not fail you. His discipline is good. It's perfect and appropriate. Discipline in love, discipline in belonging, third and finally, discipline and holiness. Look with me at verse 10. The text says, For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. In the context of comparing discipline between our earthly fathers and our heavenly divine father, the author alludes to this third purpose of formative and corrective shaping. It is to make us distinct and set us apart. Many of us rightly understand holiness to be a state where we are sacredly different from the rest of the world. In our fallenness, we are incomplete and we are too much like the world. Therefore, our Father disciplines us so that we can be more like Jesus, the complete human, the sinless human. And tough love is the means by which we, the unholy, are made holy. And for the Hebrews, persecution and suffering served as the Father's tool to make his people more functionally holy. By it, he roots out the grime and filth within our soul. Do you desire holiness? Consider this. A desire for holiness will open your heart to discipline. A desire for holiness will open your heart to discipline. Look at verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, one commentator I read understands that phrase, 
the peaceful fruit of righteousness as a synonym for holiness, I agree, discipline produces something so beautiful and praiseworthy. It's really hard to weather through it, but what God is doing inside of us is something so satisfying. That's probably why he uses the adjective peaceful. There's something so fulfilling, something so wholesome and calming when we're being made into what God has already declared we are. When God sees us, he sees Jesus because we're united to Jesus by faith. But functionally, the discipline shapes us into who he has already made us. Functionally in our living, because of indwelling sin, we are not like Jesus in whole. Therefore, God the Father leads us, his people, through this refining process that lasts up to the point of death. And we know that process as sanctification. Discipline is a subset of progressive sanctification. Just a few verses later, Hebrews 12, verse 14, the author writes, Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. If discipline makes holiness possible in the lives of God's people, then discipline also is what enables God's people to eventually see the Lord and to experience his glory. Lord willing, we'll tackle that a little more next week. But back in verse 11, the peaceful fruit of righteousness is reaped when the Lord disciplines us. The contrast between present pain and future pleasure is intended, I think, to help us contrast between this life and the life to come. In the life to come, we will not experience pain or discipline. But while we experience it now, it prepares us for what is to come. A recent example of this contrast is found in Hebrews 11, 24 and 20 through 26, where it is said of Moses, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Discipline is God's tool to ready us for heaven. The apostle Paul's parallel of this idea is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Paul writes, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Spiritual formation that takes place through our Father's, our Heavenly Father's discipline will have a never-ending impact on your life. Do you have the lens to embrace the discipline of the Lord? It is his good gift to us to demonstrate he indeed does care about us. Hear his voice through the discipline, affliction, and suffering that he brings into your life. Discipline in love, discipline in belonging, and discipline in holiness. Let me leave you with the words of Malcolm Muggeridge, a peer of C.S. Lewis, who was also converted to Christianity later in life, Muggeridge observed, quote, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have ever learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness. The result would not be to make life delectable, but to make it too banal and trivial to, to be endurable. This, of course, is what the cross signifies, and it is the cross more than anything else that has called me inexorably to Christ. End quote. 
What Muggerbridge is saying there is everything he learned, everything he learned in this life came from discipline, from hardships of life. Sounds like a man who knew he had a God who speaks, who speaks with specific words, with speaks, who speaks through discipline. Do you have that voice or do you have those ears? He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would teach us to hear your voice, to hear you speaking through the difficult circumstances, through the difficult experiences that we have in this life. For those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have believed upon Jesus, remind us of your love for us. Remind us of our belonging to you. Remind us that you are making us like your son, even through discipline. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see, we pray, O oh God. Lord, I thank you as well for the opportunity to give unto you through the spiritual discipline of giving. I pray, Father, that you would grant us worshipful and joyful hearts as we give of our finances and our resources to you so that the, the work of the ministry might be furthered at CBCOC. Lord, thank you again for your love for us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.